There's a big difference often between urgent tasks and important tasks. And all too often we allow the urgent tasks, the day-to-day -day things, to crowd out the important things that we really need to do. It's okay for a while, but eventually it catches up with you. Hi, I'm Bernie Diamond and welcome again to Christianity Works. We're heading into our next message in a series that I've called Don't Waste Your Life. Uh, look, I don't know about you, but I live in, in a mortifying fear of getting to the end of my life and looking back on a wasted life. I reckon there is nothing worse than looking back on, I don't know, 60, 70, 80, 90 years of living on this earth and thinking, what if I'd taken that opportunity? What? What if I'd listened to God and stepped out of that, that comfort zone and, and gone and done that, that crazy thing that God called me to do? I wonder what my life would have looked at if I'd followed my heart, if I'd followed my dreams, if I'd gone and tried the thing that I so desperately wanted to try but never got around to doing. The day-to-day -day crowds out those things. Here's what my life looks like. Each year... I record 80 to 90 television programs like this. Each year I record five to 600 radio programs. I write two or three books. I, you get it? And I've got a ministry to run. Now, look, I'm not saying I'm fantastic. That's just my life. It's the lot that I lead. I love it. I love doing it. But you know, even when you're, you're working away there for God, even when you're reaching lots of people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, do you know how easy it is to allow the urgent day-to-day -day tasks to crowd out the really important ones. I was just recently at a conference, the Australian Christian Media Conference. I love going to those things because it's just a few days out from the day-to-day, -day, catching up with all the people that I know from, from around the country and some from overseas as well. And you know, just those few days at that conference, somebody came up to me with an idea for something new. Somebody else came up to me with another idea. And it was like God was speaking to me through these people. God was breaking through the everyday, mundane grind of doing the same thing, same thing, head down, working hard, doing stuff for God. And, and even when you're in ministry, it's easy to miss out on the new things that God is doing. We have lots of excuses when we go to God for missing out on the new things that God's doing. I mean, I'm a guy that spends most mornings, first half hour, 45 minutes, first hour, early in the morning, praying. But even then, it's easier to have your head down rather than to be looking up. What excuses are you coming up with for not chasing after the call that God's put on your life. What excuses do you go to God with to say, God, look, I know you've given me this gift of, of speaking, this gift of caring, this gift of giving, this gift of administration. I know you've given me that gift, God, but you know what? I'm just too kind of busy doing this other thing here in my comfort zone. Because if, if we keep doing that day after day, Week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, one day it's going to be too late. And my definition of a wasted life is missing out on the call that God has for your life. The Bible's really clear that the gift and the call of God on your life is irrevocable. Just come with me. Let's have a look at that. Let's see what God has to say about that. Romans chapter 11, verse 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And what that word irrevocable means is no one can take them away. No one's going to make them go away. Jonah in the Old Testament, the call of God on his life was to take the message of repentance and salvation to the people in Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a godless city. 
Nineveh was a city that, that oppressed other people. And, and Jonah said to God, well, God, no, they don't deserve your grace. They don't deserve this. And so he ran away in the opposite direction. But when we run away, God still has his way because God's calling on your life and God's gifting to fulfill that calling is completely irrevocable. You know the story. Shipwreck in the belly of the sea monster, spat out on the beach, where? At Nineveh. And begrudgingly, he goes and proclaims the gospel to the Nineveh people. What, what excuse have you got for running away from God? Is it your comfort zone? Is it, well, this is where I live. I've worked hard for this house. I've got a mortgage. This house is not negotiable, God. I know it's a hard question. I know you probably feel like I'm pushing you a little bit, but I'm doing it deliberately because I've been there. We all end up there time and time again. I want to take you to a story that Jesus told about a rich young man who came to Jesus and said, well, Jesus, what do I have to do to get salvation? Let's have a look at this story. Matthew chapter 19, beginning at verse 16. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If, if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones? said the man. And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Also, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, I've kept all these. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard his word, he went away grieving for he had many, many possessions. Do, do you kind of relate to that a little bit? The, Jesus isn't saying here you've got to sell everything in order to follow him. What he knew was that this young man, who was quite wealthy, the one thing that was coming between him and following Jesus was his wealth. And isn't it interesting, Jesus rattles off a bunch of the Ten Commandments, don't murder, don't covet, don't, don't. but he leaves out the most important one, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. That's how Jesus sums up the most important commandments elsewhere in the New Testament. Why does he leave those out? Why doesn't he start with the first commandment and the second commandment? Well, because he knows that those two commandments are the same as selling everything this man had. If there's anything that comes before God in your life, it might be your career, it might be your house. It might be where you live. It might be your wealth. If there's anything that you are not willing to lay down for God, then that thing is an idol. When, when you take something and put it before God, it's an idol. I remember living in a really nice house. I remember sitting upstairs once. The, the master bedroom was in the attic of this beautiful old terrace house. We had a beautiful view across the inner suburbs and chimneys and smoke. It was just gorgeous. And I remember saying to God, I love this house, God. It's the most beautiful house you've ever given me. Thank you so much. And right then, right there, the Holy Spirit convicted me. So, if I ask you to give it up, will you give it up? Oh, man, God, I've just, just got it. You know, God, I just finished it. I just sitting here saying thank you and you asking me about giving it up. I felt exactly like this young ruler, this young rich man. And in that moment I said, you know what, God, you're right. I can't have anything before you. If you want to take it, take it. And can I tell you, a couple of years later, he did. A couple of years later, God convicted me to sell that house and move into a much smaller humble apartment and just as well that he did because those were the years quite some years ago now when this ministry went through a whole bunch of financial difficulties there wasn't enough money to go around if I had still had the mortgage of that big house we'd have been in serious trouble 
God's call on your life demands everything. If you want to hang on to your life, if you want to hang on to your house, if you want to hang on to your career, if you want to hang on to everything above God, then you're going to lose your life. But lose your life for Jesus' sake, and then you'll find it. Take up your cross, follow Jesus, lay down your life, and then you discover God's calling. Is it scary? Yes, it is. It feels scary at the time. It felt scary at the time to leave my consulting career and step into full-time ministry. It was really hard, I can tell you. But I didn't want to die wondering. I, I knew in my heart that this is what God was calling me to do. And I thought, either I've got to get to the point where I'm prepared to fall flat on my face and fail, or see God doing something amazing. I've got to be prepared to get to that point. And that's the point of this story. Jesus is saying, the one thing that's keeping you from following me, from following after your call, from using your gifts, is that you're wedded to your wealth. Sell it, get rid of it, give it to the poor. That was for this man. The question is, what is it for you? What, what is it? that could stop you from living out the call of God on your life, the irrevocable call, from using the gifts that God's given you to do the things that he's called you to do. Now, in my experience, as much as I enjoyed having an IT consulting firm and jetting around the world and consulting, it was a lot of fun, right? But there came a point when I knew that God was calling me to do something else. And, and at that point, the joy went out of the old thing. As much as it had been a blessing and a provision, once God takes his hand off something, he's done with it. Friend, if you know that there's something that God's calling you to do, whatever it is, it may be just to do a short mission trip. It may be just to serve on the sound desk at church. It may, whatever it is, friend, would you please, please, please go and do it? Because that's where you discover the satisfaction. That's where you discover the joy. That's where you discover the fulfillment when you start walking in the call of God on your life. Don't waste your life. Don't miss out on what God's doing. Yeah, it's going to be hard. And yes, there are going to be challenges. And there will definitely be sacrifices. But when you're out there doing what you were made to do, man, there is nothing. There is nothing that comes even close to doing that. Here at Christianity Works, our passion is to see your life transformed by the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's why right now I'm offering you a free DVD and life application booklet called Don't Waste Your Life. Some of the teaching in this series plus a booklet to help you apply that teaching to your own life. I'd love to send you a free copy. It's available right now. Here are the contact details. Get in touch with us. Request your free copy because I'd love to see this teaching make a powerful difference in your life. Don't waste your life. I'm Bernie Diamond, and you're watching Christianity Works. Let's face it, you and I love predictable and safe. We like life to be predictable, and when unpredictable things happen to us, we don't like that at all when, when a, a curved ball comes at us from out of field and hits us in the solar plexus. We kind of go, where did that come from? God, why did you let that happen? God, why is this happening in my life? Isn't that true? We don't like the unpredictable. We like safe, we like predictable, and we certainly like comfortable. Don't you like coming home to a comfortable home and sitting down and the family's there and the television's on? Comfortable is good, right? And so we get wedded to our comfort zones. And then along comes God. And he says, I have something that I want you to do. And you think, God, God, I don't want to do that. that that's hard work. That's inconvenient. That's kind of risky. I mean, God, that's risky. I've got a mortgage, you know. I've got a family. I've got, I'm going to put food on the table. <laughs> Ever been there? Sure you have. And, and if you haven't, I'm sure you will be someday. I'm going to introduce you to some people now who got dragged out of their comfort zones. And let's see what God does when we get out of our comfort zones. See, we think 
that, that when we go from here, which is nice and safe and predictable and comfortable, out into the unknown, we think all these bad things are going to happen. And the reason we do is because they're out of our control. When I stepped from a safe, comfortable consulting career, which I knew, which I understood, which provided a good, steady income, into full-time ministry where there was no steady income, where no doors were open for radio or television programs that we began to produce. You know what, that was kind of scary. It was. Fortunately, I was a young enough and naive enough Christian to, to kind of believe Jesus like a little child, which is exactly what he tells us we should do. And hopefully that's something I haven't lost because every day I'm called to step outside my comfort zone. But I get it. How wedded we can be to our comfort zones. I want to bring you to a few Bible characters now, starting with, with Abraham. What do you, when I say Abraham, what do you remember of Abraham? Well, Abraham got called to go on this long journey and, and eventually God gave them the, the son that he promised and, and God really blessed Abraham. And Abraham gets a pretty good rap when you read about him in the New Testament, looking back on what he did. But let's go right back to the beginning of Abraham's story. We're going to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country. Did you hear that? Go. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your home great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So Abraham is a pretty wealthy guy. He's got a lot of flocks, he's got a lot of possessions, he's got a lot of slaves, fairly, fairly big gathering here. And God comes along and says, pick yourself up out of this place, out of your comfort zone, and go to a land that I will show you. Where? Well, I don't know yet, but I'm going to show you. And I'm going to make of you a great nation. Are you kidding? Abraham and Sarah are 75 years old apiece. They can't have any children. How is God possibly going to make Abraham and Sarah the parents of a great nation? And where is this land? And what if it doesn't work out? And question after question after question. They're all the questions that we would have. I'm sure, we're not told, I am sure Abraham and Sarah must have sat down and gone, well, you know, this is kind of wacky. This is kind of uncertain, okay, we've got a lot of flocks and, and, and we've got a lot of stuff, but where is this land and how is God possibly going to make us the parents of a great nation? Verse 4, so Abraham went as the Lord had told him, even though he was 75 years old and childless. So this guy, Abraham, we don't think much about him. We just kind of remember him as, as God did some mighty things. He was the father of the nation of Israel. God did some mighty, powerful things for Abraham. But the reality is the first step in the story of Israel is Abraham and Sarah stepping outside their comfort zone. Let me introduce you to another guy, a king. His name is Jehoshaphat. Come with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning at verse 15. In fact, let's go back just a page or two, and see what happened to the nation. We're going to chapter 20, verse 1. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Meonites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea. Already they are at Hazazontamar, that is, En Gedi. Jehoshaphat was afraid. He set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast through all of Judah. Jehoshaphat was afraid. Here he is the king and this overwhelming multitude, this army that he can't possibly defeat is coming against him. And rightly, Jehoshaphat was afraid. He was outside his comfort zone. His comfort zone was about to get turned upside down. Ever had that happen to you? Everything's going along fine and then all of a sudden, a marriage falls apart, somebody dies, somebody loses their job, somebody gets sick. And you're thinking, God, well, what? I'm afraid. What am I going to do? What did Jehoshaphat do? Jehoshaphat set himself to seek the Lord and he proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. 
As it turned out, um, they got all together, they had a big prayer meeting and a prophet got up and a prophet spoke and gave them a word that God would fight the battle for him. So let's go and see how this, un this pans out. Let's flip down to verse 15. He said, listen all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, this is the prophet speaking, do not fear or be dismayed at this great multitude for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them they will come up by the ascent of Aziz and you will find them at the end of the valley before the wilderness of Jeruel, before the wilderness of Jeruel. This battle is not for you to fight. Take your position, stand still and see the victory of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. You see, God could have done this another way. God could have said through the prophet, Look, I'm going to fight this battle for you. You guys stay back in town. You guys stay back behind the walls and behind all your defences, behind all your embattlements. Sit at home, be safe, and I will fight the battle. But God didn't do it that way. God called Jehoshaphat to go out with his army, put himself completely at risk, be completely vulnerable, depend completely on God. And then... When they were out there, God would defeat this army. How? Did God explain through the prophet how he would do that? Did he say, look, I've got a plan. Here's how the plan is going to work. A, B, C, D, you'll be fine. God doesn't do that. God simply called Jehoshaphat and his army to stand against overwhelming odds and trust God. There's a message there for you and me. When, when overwhelming odds come against us, when we're out there doing what we believe God's calling us to do, Jehoshaphat was being king, just like God wanted him to be. And bad stuff comes against us. Friend, God is there. It's not time for you to run away. It's not time for you to retreat. It's not time for you to pull back. It's not time for you to give up on God's calling. No! If God's put you here, if God's called you to, to do this mission, to look after these children, to provide for this ministry. If God's called you to do whatever he's called you to do, your God will show up in the battles. Your God will fight the battles that you can't fight. But he still expects you to stump up. He still expects you to show up every day. He still expects you to be there, vulnerable, completely at his mercy. And your God will show up. This is the stuff that happens when we follow the call of God. You want to go and retreat and sit behind the battlements, go back to the safety of your comfort zone? Let me tell you, your comfort zone isn't as comfortable as what you think it is. Your, your comfort zone is not as safe as what you think it is. You know, I, I live in a safe country. I, I live in a suburb where there's no fighting and there's not people getting killed and there's no risk of war. And it, but you know what? I'm at sea level. A tsunami could hit tomorrow. I don't expect it to. But my, my home that I take for granted, that I think will always be there, is just as vulnerable as anyone or anything else. Comfort zones aren't safe. Comfort zones are the places where we retreat and we miss out on the call of God. The really powerful things that God does always, always happen outside your comfort zone, just as they did for Jehoshaphat, just as they did for Abraham, and just as they did for the next Bible character we're going to look at. Perhaps you know the story of Esther. Esther was a queen. She was called to go and step in front of the king to petition him for her people, the Hebrews. Now, if you went into the king without being asked, unless he raised his scepter, you were there at pain of death. Esther had to take a huge risk to go and petition her husband, the king, for her people who were going to be wiped out, who were going to be killed. This is what happens. Her uncle Mordecai tells her about the plot against the Hebrews and he says this to her. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all of the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, day or night. 
I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther had a call on her life. It was a big call. It was a call at the pain of death. And yet God worked through her. She followed that call and God showed up. She wasn't killed and the people's lives were spared. You and I have no idea of the impact of God's call on our lives. Seriously, we have no idea of the impact of God's call on our lives. When God calls you, my friend, he's going to call you at a great cost. And there will be fear and there will be uncertainty. Abraham, Jehoshaphat, Esther. We could look at a whole bunch more characters today too. Don't give up. Don't shrink away. Don't withdraw back to your comfort zone. You can do that. But you'll end up looking back on a wasted life. Well, that's all we have time for today. I'm Bernie Diamond and you've been watching Christianity Works, please don't forget about that free teaching DVD and booklet that I've told you about too. It's called Don't Waste Your Life. It's my free gift to you today. So get in touch with us using the contact details right there on your screen right now. And don't forget, if you go to our website, you can also have instant access to my free daily e-devotional, words of inspiration, hope and encouragement delivered right to your inbox each weekday for you to bless you and to turn your life upside down with the good news of Jesus Christ. I'll catch you again same time next week with another episode of Christianity Works.